It looks like a zombie takeout threw up in here. What's up? Welcome to episode 199 of Zombie Zombie Takeout, the B Moving Cult Movie Podcast. I'm Uncle John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got some listener submitted, finally. Um, that doesn't happen often. Okay. And, well, you're not going to believe this, but it's an email from Shane Carruth. Wait. Yes. Really? The Shane Carruth. In fact, he, he included a photo of himself next to a computer monitor showing our site to, to prove it was him, and I went over it. It's not photoshopped. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's the good news. The bad news, he said, you guys need to stop reviewing my movies if you're just going to keep misunderstanding them. Primer has nothing to do with trust or power or even time travel. It was obviously an allegory for the complexities inherent in modern-day train schedule management. And don't even get me started on how wrong you were about upstream color. It should be clear as day to anyone with a fraction of a brain that the blue parasite represents the struggles faced by the poor migrant Lombada dancers of East Jabib. I'll spare you the explanation of what the pigs represent, as I doubt that your small minds could handle it, but it has something to do with contemporary baristery. I think he made that word up. I think so, too. If you insist on reviewing my next film, The Modern Ocean, please spare us the moronic interpretations involving shipping routes and tools and try to understand what I'm really saying. I'll give you a hint. Flea circuses. Ah, oh. uh, you spoiled it. I, I apparently Shane doesn't like our reviews. This is worse than the time I met the ghost of Joseph Campbell. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, well, I was gonna say happier things, but well, on to some news. Okay. Both of these are from Cinema Bond. First story: One more familiar face in Episode Seven. Deadline reports that J.J. Abrams has revealed via his second cousin's Twitter account that there will be yet another familiar face in Star Wars Episode 7. Controversial Gungan slash veiled racial stereotype Jar Jar Binks. I knew it. The tweet in question saying, Jar Jar's in the movie, bitches. Yeah, I went there. And then in parentheses, <laughs> mic drop. All right. When reached for comment, George Lucas said, oh, fuck no. I knew I should have killed off that step and fetch it motherfucker when I had the chance. Don't do it, JJ. Don't make the same mistake that I did. The fanboys will haunt your dreams for the rest of your life. Star Wars Episode Seven is set to be released in the U.S. on December 18th, 2015. Well, I change everything I've said. I think I want to see this now. I want to see what he's going to do with this, because, I mean, that's insane. Yeah, because um, you were the one last week saying he's not going to be in the movie when well, I was a bit concerned about it, but yeah. apparently JJ has other ideas. Um, apparently he thinks he can redeem the character maybe along the lines of what you were talking about um although yeah i went there and bitches kind of suggests that he's just doing it to piss the the old school fans off yeah probably yeah it's kind of a very strange reverse psychology of him not wanting the fans to see the movie i think yeah uh well consider you know how much he changed star trek you know maybe he's Trying to go against the expectations with um, Star Wars as well, but doing but it in a much worse way. Humor me, since this is so many years later after the fall, you know, since Order 66 right, right, and the right. prequels, just an alcoholic Jar Jar Binks, you know, just, you know, eating himself away pretty much. Oh, it's possible that this could be a good thing, yeah. Yeah. Huh, well, we'll just have to wait and see, but it, it definitely, I mean, I was already, you know, desperate to see them, but this just makes me a little bit more so. All right, next story. Um, this is just weird. Um, not necessarily good or bad. Um, feud leads to unexpected collaboration. It appears that the feud between directors Zack Snyder and Terry Gilliam has come to an end. Variety reports that the two will be working together on a remake of the 2002 Britney Spears vehicle Crossroads about a girl who goes on a cross-country road trip with two friends and some dude who just happens to have a car in an effort to become a mediocre pop star. Set in 2850, the remake will feature a CGI character in the Britney Spears role that sources say will be a combination of B. Arthur and Nathan Fillion. Wow. 
There's no word on other casting, though there are rumors that Dan Aykroyd is looking to have himself cryogenically frozen in the hopes of reprising his role as the father. Apparently, he doesn't understand the difference between setting and filming date. Crusher is scheduled to begin filming in July of this year. God, could you imagine it'll be like a fear and loathing in Las Vegas with Britney Spears? Well, no, it's not Britney Spears in the movie, although that would be awesome. Um, yeah. It's the CG combination of B. Arthur and Nathan Fillion, which sounds intriguing. I thought that was Britney Spears. Oh, maybe, yeah. I mean, maybe they're just trying to make it Britney at the age she was when she yeah. shot the original. Okay, right. yeah. That's a possibility, and then, you know, Dan Aykroyd, well, he'll be cryogenically frozen, so we won't have to worry about him being in the movie. I think he would deliver just as good a performance cryogenically frozen as he does now. Yeah, yeah, probably. Unless he's chasing a gopher. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Zoe Saldana, a bit too successful for this, probably, at this point. She's had a few hits, so I don't know who they'll get for that role. The other two in the movie, whose names I can't come up with, might as well just do it. (laughs) Oh, I take that back. He was... The gopher guy in the sequel to Caddyshack. That's right. He took Murray's role. Oh, right, right, right. He wasn't even good that. chasing the gopher. No, no. The fuck, man? He was Elwood Blues and Ray yeah. from the Ghostbusters, and that's about it. And if you really think about it, it's the same role. Yeah, yeah, very much so. He was a straight yeah. man. He, he did yeah. one thing. Exactly. And he did the straight man thing well, but he doesn't really act. You know, Joe Friday. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's the same role. Right. All right, so on to this week's movie, which is from 1998, Beaches. And, of course, the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by Absurdism. Tennis racket, spaghetti cruise ship. And also brought to you by Improvisation. No. I've often said that I've been waiting for the plot summary, but I think I can honestly say that there's no movie we've reviewed that I've been more eager to hear a plot summary for. All right, so... We have these uh, friends, these childhood friends, who uh, they meet each other uh, at at a beach, and uh, they promise that they're going to be best friends forever. And it's told through a series of flashbacks uh, between, well, one who is uh, stricken ill uh, actually, it's it's told through the point of view of the friend who's not ill. Right. So she's um, speeding over to to meet her before her her passing, mm-hmm. and uh, we get this flashback, and it's um, it's on the uh, the lunar surface. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I don't know. A big surprise. Yeah, I wasn't expecting any sci-fi here at all. But then again. I hadn't seen this movie before. So right. It's the first time I've ever seen this one. Yeah, same here. And uh, they're on the lunar surface, and uh, they're playing golf. I think Neil Armstrong was still there, and um, they were keeping score. And um, I'm not sure who won the game, but then they went back to the flashback of her driving this car to uh, San Francisco. It's really... It's very disjointed i think yeah 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 the entire plot it it kind of feels like a bad version of amazon women or kentucky fried where it's just all of these bizarre random scenes thrown together yeah the last thing i thought when we were gonna we were doing this and i thought we were crazy for doing this oh yeah uh but the last thing i thought we were gonna get was pretty much a zucker type movie i mean I'd heard terminal illness Mm -hmm. you know i thought they were just doing a terms of endearment knockoff kind of thing and, you know, trying to get the chick flick, you know, dollar. And I put up the trailer today, and I, there was no hint of any of that in the trailer. Right, I know. So, man, I don't know how much I want to reveal of this, because yeah. a lot well, of it is the surprise. Yeah, true. I mean, there's some points I've covered, I've got in my notes that I, I that are going to be spoilers. Yeah. I, I really can't avoid talking about a couple of things, particularly toward the end. Right, so, I mean... If you really, if you haven't seen this movie before, maybe you should not listen to the rest of this episode until the after you do. Yeah, probably for the best. I mean, unless you don't mind being spoiled or just have no intention of seeing the movie, have no interest in yeah. it. Yeah. Although, if you're basing that on the trailer, think again. You might want to reconsider. Right. They completely hid in it's a, a swerve, a, a giant shocker here. Yeah. That yeah. 
that I don't think I'll reveal right away. So mm. I'll just say hilarity ensues mm. at this point. Now, just starting off with a bit of trivia, um, it turns out that 2,500 watermelons and 500 jars of mayonnaise were used in the uh, beach scene. Apparently, most of the watermelons broke. Um, incidentally, that scene was shot in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, uh, not too far from here, in the oh, middle shit. Yeah, in the middle of January, so Bette Midler must have been really cold in the G-string and pasties. Mm. Yeah, that, I was kind of busy looking at the watermelon seeds, honestly. <laughs> I don't think they hid that too well. No. Uh, no. I mean, a beach should not be pink with green rind bits all over the place yeah. like that. Right, yeah, you could see the, the carnage of the former watermelons all over the beach. It was a little unsettling. I mean, this was Sharknado shitty special effects. Yeah, I don't understand. Yeah. I thought this was a pretty big budget movie. Although, with one exception, I thought the blast doors on the space station looked amazing. Hmm. They looked incredibly real. Um, Could have done without the 10-minute Tom Jones musical number while well, he was floating in space. Part of the movie. But I mean, he was floating in space, and he didn't even have a helmet on. I, I have to nitpick that. I mean, he was wearing a full EV suit, but without a helmet. Well... You wouldn't be able to hear him singing anyway. It's it's space. True. No true. one can hear Tom Jones sing in space. Yeah, and they did that for ten minutes. Although speaking of musical numbers, well, sort of musical numbers, I do think Macaulay Culkin stole the movie when he tap danced on the six foot sub. Well, wait a minute. Do we want to give away what Tom Jones sang in space? Uh, might as well. I mean, Frank Zappa. You know, don't yeah. eat the yellow snow. I just. Amazing. Yeah. You would think he would do Let Me Take You to the Beach, given it's beaches, but no, he did Yellow Snow. Yeah. Another little factoid, the producer spent $500 million to install stripper poles onto the beach. And I think that was a poor, poor... Uh, Investment, yeah. Yeah. Particularly when they could have just brought some sand into a soundstage. Um, particularly poor investment because they broke Chekhov. They showed the poles but never used them. Well, didn't you see when the sumo wrestler came and used that one? Oh, I was trying to forget that part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, speaking of parts I'm trying to forget, um, this movie marks the directorial debut of M. Night Shyamalan. Um, not the movie itself. He directed the massage scene in the middle with the happy ending. Incidentally, who would have expected, you know, hardcore porn in the middle of this? It was a welcome respite, though. Yeah, true, true, true. Um, especially when it was right after the Justin Bieber cameo. Um... I didn't even think he'd been born when this movie made was made. Me either. I, yeah, that's definitely a flaw in the space-time continuum there. Yeah, yeah. Um, did like how they killed him off, though. Um, it was a well, nice flashback to the space station scene. And and I think it inspired a bit of Dead Like Me, you know, if you remember how Dead Like Me started. Well, yeah, the toilet seat. Yeah, um, very similar. And it was, you know, Justin Bieber dying, so all good. Well, I thought you were going with the, the big shocker. Mm. The appearance... Of Ray Park in the Darth yeah. Maul outfit. Yeah, that was a big surprise. Um, especially when they had him actually split in half. I don't know how they pulled that off. Well, and he split Barbara Hershey in two. Yeah, yeah. But I just, of course, I Link did not see that coming. Yeah. yeah. And then you had that moment when Bette Midler took the double-ended lightsaber and started using it as a stripper pole. I, I don't know how the physics works on that, but I, I could have gone without it. Well, yeah, wouldn't it have just... Driven straight into the ground? I think it it should have, sense. yeah. And speaking of parts I could have gone without, that, that sudden out-of-nowhere tribute to blues legend Robert Johnson, it was very touching, but also a bit disrespectful because they had, you know, Corey Feldman portraying him. Hmm. Although I did love the um, Akira crossover. You know, they were put out in the same year, 1988. Oh, that's right. And apparently there was some cross-promotion going on. Um, did you notice the, the scene... With the capsules and the clowns fighting while the giant tidal wave loomed over the city. Is that the same scene where all the robots started transforming and yes, stuff? Yes, yes. I think Jerry Bruckheimer was actually a uh, fifth director or unit director. Yeah, you know, I was this. thinking I was thinking Bay, but it was a bit before his time. Probably Bruckheimer, you're right yeah. about that. Now, I can't avoid talking about the ending. All right. Now, I, I loved it. I, I never would have expected Bugs Bunny to be the killer. Oh, come on. It was so obvious, though. Was it really? There were carrot bits all over the place every time yeah. someone was dead. I really couldn't tell them apart from the watermelon carnage. And then, you know, that 
terrible like Brooklyn accent that you know somebody was trying to uh, well, disguise. I think it was I think it was Bette Midler actually. Uh, and and my Bialik in the beginning and yeah, so there were a lot of bad accents in the movie. Yeah, so I mean it was obviously you know it was Bugs Bunny dressed in a Bette Midler suit the whole time. Yeah. I'm sorry to give that away. That, now that you mention it, you're probably right about that. It was it was dick. pretty obvious. Yeah. Because, I mean, all those times you see Bugs Bunny dressing as a woman in the cartoons. Mm -hmm. uh, We should have been prepared for it, right? He was hotter than Bette Midler was. Well, of course. But he was also younger back then. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, 88, so he was a bit Bit up there. Ready for it, yeah. Now, as much as I did like that ending, it was kind of ruined by the three-hour Chris Tucker monologue right afterward. But that's when they pulled Elmer Fudd out of the uh, gimp suit, right? Yeah, yeah, which was amusing. Um, but it was just Chris Tucker talking for three hours and, and Elmer Fudd and various other characters coming out of the gimp suit like it's a clown car. Um, I don't know how they fit Foghorn Leghorn in there. Mm. But it, it just kind of brought the movie down for me. Okay, I'm pretty much done with my notes. Yeah, just one last thing. Okay. There, there was a very... I can't believe Tarantino ripped this off, too. I had no idea this movie had oh. influenced so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when, uh, when they brought Barbara Hershey's body to Bette Midler's house, when the daughter did that, right. uh, she kept wondering if this was dead diva storage. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, was there a sign on the front that said dead diva storage and, and why? Yeah. Why did you bring her here? And then they cut into the music from uh, behind the music, which really just didn't make sense there. No, it didn't. You know, you expected someone to say, you know, that's when it all changed. Right. Yeah. All right. So on to sequels and remakes. On to sequels and remakes. Of course, we all know that there were 50 sequels, um, starting with Sons of Beaches. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. I think my favorites, though, were Beaches 4, Beaches in Space, and uh, Beaches 34, Beaches in the Hood. I was just going to say, Beaches in the Hood was phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Even better than the original, which is rare. That That's a movie I truly want to cry. The relationship yeah. between Ice-T and Ice Cube. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, the, you know, that was the origin of the line, never want to quit you and stuff. I And, and didn't even have to use my AK. Right. I have to say it was a good day. Damn. Make it to be a gangster. Although I would like to see a remake. I think Snyder and Gilliam would be great for this project, not the bloody Crossroads remake. Yeah, I think this would be a much better choice for them. All right, so on to Brains. On to Brains. I loved it up until that ending. And, and the big reveal of Bugs Bunny, you saw it coming, I didn't. I, I was loving it up until Chris Tucker showed up. That, and I can't even call that the ending, because, I mean, in terms of time, it wasn't even the halfway mark. But in terms of the story, it kind of was the end. It was just a really obscenely long denouement. Kind of ruined it for me. I'm going to go too. Uh, I'm a little bit ahead of you. Um, I mean, because I, I think just for sheer gall, you know, just sheer balls of this yeah, film yeah. and all the things they did, I'm giving this 3.141592653599 brains. All right. And so what have we learned? Uh, we learned where Tarantino, Lucas, uh, and all of these great filmmakers have been influenced. And, you know, fuck you, Mr. Carruth. Yeah. I'm kind of pissed by it. I think we glossed over that one too much. Yeah, maybe we didn't that really. shit. Yeah, well, I guess we maybe won't do a modern ocean now. I guess not. And I learned just exactly what Bed Midler can do to a watermelon. Um, and I kind of wish I didn't know. And a lightsaber. Yeah. All right, so until next time. I won't say next week because, well, as you're hearing this, it'll probably be next week. Um, but as we're recording, it's two weeks. Um, yeah, we'll need a couple weeks. So until next time, when we will be reviewing Highlander, go to zombietakeout.com. Check out the album art, the episode description. Of course, the episode itself, which you're already listening to. Links to find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and now YouTube. Links to subscribe via RSS and iTunes. Please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. You also find the movie list, every movie we've reviewed so far, and every movie we're going to review, up through, I think it's 202, Reform School Girls. That number probably keeps changing by one every time I say it. Well, right, and the significance of next week's episode, or next episode, oh, I the next say. episode, oh, I, I glossed over that, I'm sorry. Um, It is episode 200. 
we're doing Highlander, and then somehow we're doing Highlander 2 twice. Twice. <laughs> That's going to be real interesting the second time. Because the first time is going to be a normal review. Uh, the second one, I don't know what else we're going to say other than talking about the changes. Anyway, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. you also find the request form. If you've got a movie you'd like to hear us review, please leave it on the request form. And, of course, the recommendations list. It was almost there for me. It was. I was really close. I was at a five until Tucker showed up. I and was it just like took the wind out of it. Eight, yeah. seven, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight, six away from it. You can also email us, zombietakeout at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 414-368-ZTL1, or for the alphanumerically challenged, 414-368-9861. Always remember that you will always be calling from the middle of Milwaukee. And of course, until next time, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. Holy mackerel, kid, what planet do you live on? April April Fools. Fools. Yeah, that whole thing was... Well, okay. The beginning, obviously, I'm Uncle John. I'm Scotto. All of that was legit. I am Scotto. Yeah, the the intro line was from Beaches. The plot summary was almost accurate um, up until you went to the moon. Um, And, of course, the outro stuff was all our normal stuff. And, yes, we are reviewing Highlander next. Everything else was improvised on the... Well, not on the spot. No. (laughs) was, Was off the top of our heads... No, we had no clue what the other was going to say. Anyway, I wrote the email. Shane Carruth did not email us. Just want to make that very, very clear. As far as we know, he still does not know who we are. I also wrote the news stories. Um, For the rest, we just had some notes. We just played it off. But yeah, that was all a joke. Which would you rather have, though? Him not knowing who we are or him hating us? Probably not knowing who we are. You'd prefer that? Yeah, I think so. It, I, don't know. I, I couldn't bear that. I know when we reviewed Primer, we were kind of off. I, I made a comment about that uh, when I re-listened to it recently, and I, I said how adorable it was that we thought we understood it after two and two and change viewings. He's got to be used to bigger idiots coming up to him, though, with uh, far out. I mean, come on. I I was at the QA, and somebody had these insane theories and ideas about what the movie, what what I think Upstream meant. Mm-hmm. And he was just like, I think it was about cruelty to animals this person uh-huh. came up with. And he was just kind of like, what yep. the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> kind of, like trying not to tell her off. But that that's an interesting view. But that that is not what I was getting. Yet. Right. Yeah, my my crack about the, the migrant uh, Lombada dancers of Ishta Bib was probably more accurate. <laughs> yes. Yes, I think it was more accurate than this woman. Anyway, yeah, so that was all a joke, just to make it clear. But we are reviewing Highlander next time, so see you next time.